evening we're going to talk about pursuit of happiness. It comes from Psalm, uh, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But, you know, we live in a land where we have a constitution, and the constitution that we have grants us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that pursuit of happiness, the ungodly have turned into a license. And really, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, just whatever, whatever you want, whatever you, you want to do. You can hurt other people, you can uh, enslave other people in, in ways, but, but just that pursuit of happiness, happiness is hard to determine. It's just one of those things that, well, what makes the individual happy? Well, I think you agree with me that everybody wants to be happy. I don't know too many people that don't want to be happy. They just have a hard time getting to that level. There are so many things that displease them. Well, David wrote in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And, and you can see a progression there. You know, somebody listens to somebody who's got evil intents and all of a sudden they're walking with them and then they're part of the gang. They're just sitting there with them and, you know, what, what are they scoffing about? Well, they're scoffing about the laws, the rules, the commandments that God has given us, essentially, that, that really do bring us happiness, that help us to have uh, happy and healthy relationships one with another. And, and that's this idea of blessedness. In fact, some of the newer translations will use happy instead of blessed. But I think it's blessed. Blessed is the proper term because it's something that comes from God. It's just not something that makes us feel good. It's something that comes from God. And, and sometimes blessings from God come with great responsibilities. And they're a challenge for us, but we find that if we go through them, we take the responsibilities, uh, move forward, that God is there to help us in implementing these things that would make us to be blessed or to find the happiness that God wants us to have. Man has just so polluted the context of happiness that he can't seem to be happy no matter how hard he tries. Think of all the ways people have tried. Societies, cultures have tried to promote happiness and they failed. Uh, Communism, socialism, you know, that was supposed to make people happy, right? And what does it do? It causes death and destruction and, and causes people to, to lose hope. So we know that it can't be in things of that nature. Well, the reason for this is that man is seeking for happiness in the wrong place. He's seeking it really in obedience to Satan rather than obedience to God. Because it's God who blesses us, and that's where our happiness really should come from. So in the creation, we find that God created mankind, created us to be happy. Now, it doesn't say it in those words, but think of what God did. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, 28. So God created man in his, that's God's, own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Dominion. A rule, a, a, a higher position to keep things and, and to make things or keep things good as in the sight of God everything that he created was good and in the end he says it's very good. So God created man to be happy by giving him everything necessary for a peaceful existence. A peaceful, I'm not even going to say a prosperous uh, existence. Man didn't have to do a whole lot. He had everything provided for him. God created a perfect environment in what we call the earth. There, we know of no other place in the universe where life could exist. Uh, 
scientists are trying to find it. Trying to find it. Spending billions, billions, maybe even trillions of dollars trying to find it. We need to be taking care of the life here on this earth and appreciating what we've got right here and seeing what God has done to, to make a place for us, his people. God provided for all the physical needs that we have, such as food, water, air. You know, what could we do without them? And, and you know, I, I read an article not too long ago when it comes to uh, living things. You know, there are living things that do not need oxygen. But every living thing needs water. And isn't that interesting, the emphasis that the Bible places on water all the way through. It's amazing. But you know, there are anaerobic uh, organisms out here. It, it put them in air and they die. But they still need water. Uh, God provided for all of man's emotional needs. How did he do that? He established family. Husband-wife connection, Adam and Eve. Children coming from that uh, connection, that relationship, uh, yeah, man needs others. And, and who do we need more than family? You know, that's something that, that God has placed a small society right there for each each individual that he can have a part of. Uh, God provided for man's social and psychological needs by giving him work and responsibility. When people do not have responsibilities, become worthless to a large degree. Even children need to have chores to do and learn how to do the chores, learn how to help take care of themselves, not be to grow up to be independent, you know, the type of people that God would want them to be. And there are various things that we can look at, but, but when we make people dependent on other people, it, it kind of destroys their psyche. Now, sometimes they overcome it and they rise up and say, hey, we want liberty, we want freedom to make our own choices, but, but lots of times they just go through life with no hope, no goals, no ambitions, or anything of that nature. And God provided for the spiritual needs of man by giving him a law and a way of communicating with his creator. God gave us that. God gave us that ability to be able to talk to Him and to worship Him. Everything we need to worship Him, He's given us. And we can give it right back to Him. Adam and Eve, as the forerunners of all mankind, turned from God, sought their own way of happiness through what we now understand, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Those things were there. And, and John says, those things do not come from the Father. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. They're something that the devil brought. They're, they're the things that the devil set in front of Adam and Eve and sets before all of us to kind of catch our attention and to draw our adoration. You know, there's a song that uh, Dan Seals sung quite a number of years ago. I just heard it on the radio again, uh, I think it was last week. Uh, Everything that glitters is not gold. You know, uh, a woman, uh, she either marries a guy, I think they're married anyway, uh, they rodeo and and she takes off, she leaves him with a little girl to raise. And, you know, she's out having a good time. But, you know, that's the, the story. You know, everything that glitters is not gold. And Satan can make some pretty terrible things glitter and make it look like it's worth something when it really isn't. Now, John says the world is passing away along with its desires. It, it, it's it's not going to last, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, you can break down this lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life uh, a little bit more, and Paul does that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. He 
He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, back, it was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago with Mary Ellen Harpster listening to a, a, one of the summer uh, uh, sermon series uh, about the book of Proverbs. You know, don't be friends with an angry man. It'll get you in trouble. You know, eventually something will happen and, and it can cause all kinds of destruction. So that, that fits of anger, uh, those are things that we don't need in our lives and we don't even need to be around people who, who do those kind of things. Yet, these are the very things that men will engage in in the pursuit of happiness. They think those type of things will make them happy produce something out of the ordinary, a sorcery. Now, did you know that in the scriptures, sorcery comes from the Greek word that we use for pharmacy. It's about people who use drugs to control other people. And sometimes people will do that, sometimes they do it for money, Okay. But sometimes they do it to control other people, to control a group of people, what have you. And so, does that make them happy? No, because they have to be suspicious of everybody in that type of a situation. They can't put their guard down. There's no happiness there. But that's what people, that's what people of the world engage in trying to find happiness. Most people live for the thrill of the moment or the right to do their own thing. You know, that's that's what we heard several years ago, wasn't it? You've got to do your own thing. Well, doing your own thing's all right if you want to suffer the consequences. Just don't drag me into it where I've got to suffer the consequences for you. You know, if you want to do something, you go do it. Don't expect me to pay for it. Don't expect me to pay for your treatment. You know, go ahead. That, that, that's your business, but you're not probably not going to find happiness in such a thing. Now, David wrote that walking in the counsel of the ungodly will not bring one happiness. But the ungodly people say, so just look at it. Look at it, and you can tell. Now, sometimes it's tough, and if you've been reading the, the newspapers or some of the internet accounts of what goes on at the Vatican, you can see the evil ungodliness of things that are going on there. People who are supposed to be holy people, we talked about holy you know, this morning, you look at some of the things going on there and you wonder why people look at Christianity as the world sees it and, and so I don't want to have a, anything to do with that. Look at those people. Is it hypocrisy? Well, yes, hypocrisy to a degree, but more than that, it is evil that is infiltrated and taken control over a vast amount of, of other people's lives. The ungodly are those who, without God's, who are without God's word or to ignore it. And that's basically what they do. They just ignore God's word. You know, well, whatever this person said or that person said or whatever our church canon says, uh, that's more important than what the scriptures say and what our traditions are. That's more important than what the Bible says. So to listen to the ungodly will lead one away from that which can actually make him happy. I'm sorry. <clears throat> happy which is the Word of God. The law of the Lord can make us happy because it will bring us peace and prosperity the way that God would have us to, uh, lead us to. So when one strays from the Word of God, he's being led away by sinners, led away in the way of sinners, led away from happiness. To where eventually he's sitting in the seat of the scoffers. 
I like what King James says, the scornful. The people who, yeah, there ought to be scorn for what they do, for the way they act, the way they behave in public. So uh, that's what it is. Walk, uh, you listen to the counsel of the ungodly, you walk in the way of sinners, you become a scoffer of those who you do. You will soon become a, become a scoffer of those who do find happiness in fulfilling the law of the Lord. Because God's people really don't want to be a part of that. They don't, don't want to have that happening in their community, let alone within their church. Happiness, therefore, is found in the counsel of the godly. Walking in the way of righteousness and sitting in the seat of those who worship and praise God. That's where it happens. That God designed. And God didn't design anything bad. But that's what God designed. Psalm 2, verse 12, the last part of that verse, Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. That our refuge is in God. He is our hope. He is our stay. He is the rock on whom we, we stand uh, in whom we exist. Proverbs <coughs> chapter 8, verse 32, the writer says, And now, O sons, look <coughs> me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Because he was writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit the ways to live out what God's law says. Now, it's part of God's law, the book of Proverbs, but the instructions on how to put it into practice. And so that's a really good book, just like the book of James in the New Testament. How do I put these things into practice? How do I make it real in my life? <laughs> Solomon and the other writers of the Proverbs and James, you know, make it very clear. Here's how you do it. Uh, so. Revelation 2.14, another beatitude, we would say, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. That's heaven for eternity. That's our next level of existence. So we're blessed, but we've got to wash our robes here, which means being cleansed by the water and the blood so that we have that right to eat of the tree of life and live forever, not die forever. He, the, the, the interplay in there, there's eternal life and there's eternal death. Now, no one really wants to look at death and, you know, hope. I guess there are some who do, but, but imagine dying and death never come. Dying and death never come. That's what hell is for eternity. The soul is dying, but it never dies. It never quits existing. It just stays there in that condition for eternity. Now, eternal life is so much better. And that's the hope that God gives to us. These, this is the true way of happiness. If we love, trust, and obey God, we are promised eternal happiness. That's the eternal life. And how does God do that? I don't know exactly. But I know God's got it under control. He's got the plan. I don't. It's not within man that walks to direct his own footsteps, let alone tell you how it's going to be beyond. All I know is everything the Bible says about it, it's going to be great. God's ideal of happiness is found in Psalm 1. Life is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's where we find a happiness that leads to peace and contentment when we read and meditate on that law and then put it to practice in our lives. That's where we find the happiness because this world isn't going to provide a whole bunch of happiness. Oh, there might be some things that make us happy, but 
there's a lot of catastrophe. There, there's a lot of bad things that happen in this world because it is a fallen world. So God's word and the giving of the gospel is such a great hope that encourages us to find that happiness that exists in being a child of God. Our delight, the thing that will make us happy, is the law of the Lord. But that's how he designed it. That, that, that's how he made That's why he gave it to us. Not to make us sad, not to throw us back, even though there are some times when we need to be chastised. And, you know, the great thing about God is he's, he loves us and he'll chastise us because we're children. If God didn't love us, he wouldn't chastise us. He wouldn't try to get us to turn our lives around and, and to serve him. Jesus describes the same type of delight in what we call the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, in control, you know, blessing. Here, here's where blessings lie. Here's where God's blessings lie. When we do these things, we are blessed. And there's a happiness that's found in that. If we delight in the law of the Lord and we meditate it and we apply it in our lives, then we'll be able to shout with the Apostle Paul, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. There's reason to rejoice as a child of God. There's a reason for us to be happy. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people living around us that kind of makes us sad because they're not the children of God. But yet we've got something, and that happiness can go a long way in probably convincing, maybe convincing them that hey, there's something to this, this Christian life. So God made man to be happy. But to be truly happy, one must follow God's pattern for happiness. And that is delighting in the law of the Lord. Now as we finish up tonight, I'm just going to read down through uh, Psalm 1. Listen to the words of this and, and let's, let's try to seek God's happiness as we go through our lives this week. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He's delivered it to us. He's told us what it is, but the way of the wicked will perish. It's going to end, and it's going to end in a very bad way. So the lesson is yours. Thank you so very much for your time. If you have any need for that, let your request be made known as we stand and sing in the first song.